Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the International Spy Museum. Uh, my name is Vince Houghton. I am the museum's historian. And it's my great pleasure today to have with us Nicholas Davidoff. Uh, sorry, Davidoff. See, that's the problem we had. We went back and forth a hundred times. Uh, but as, as we talked about in the past, uh, my last name gets pronounced 75 different ways, so I feel you. Nicholas Davidoff, um, who, uh, who, who came to my attention uh, quite some years ago um, I, because of his book on Mo Berg. And uh, Berg himself, uh, working at the Spy Museum, my field is intelligence history, um, I actually found out about Mo Berg not through intelligence, not through his work in the OSS, actually through baseball. Uh, one of the rare people that actually know Mo Berg as a baseball player before a spy. Uh, it's because I grew up in a city that didn't have a professional baseball team. So I was forced to, uh, to adopt my father's team, uh, the Boston Red Sox. And uh, I certainly would have been disowned if I had picked anybody else. And uh, my father was a huge fan of Ted Williams. Uh, and I grew up wanting to be Ted Williams. Of course, I'm a right-handed batter. And I didn't hit very well, so I was the furthest thing from Ted Williams you could possibly find. But a lot of our conversations about how do I become Ted found me having a conversation with my father about a little known third string backup, even to a third string catcher, uh, who didn't hit very well, but stayed in the major leagues for many, many years because of his mind, because of how he was able to intellectually face the game of baseball. And the urban legend, of course, is that Mo Berg taught Ted Williams how to hit, which makes no sense whatsoever, because Mo Berg couldn't hit for his life. Um, but just the idea about facing pitchers and using your brain and, and understanding how to approach the game of baseball was something that really, really stuck to me as a intellectual that couldn't play baseball either. I really uh, identified with Mo Berg from an early age. Then when I went to grad school, I started studying nuclear intelligence and ran into Mo Berg again in the archives this time in OSS documents. And I'm like, this can't be the same Mo Berg. And that led me to The Catcher Was a Spy, uh, which we're now celebrating the 20th anniversary of this book, um, which uh, you know, I, I hope that doesn't make you feel old. But uh, th this book is bestseller celebrated. I've given it as Christmas presents. You're welcome. Um, because I think that this is something that not only for the baseball fan, but also for the intelligence fan, uh, is a mu must read. Um, now, uh, this is not the only book, certainly, uh, that I appreciate. Uh, his, your newest book, uh, which again, is about a team that, that it has some issues, whether or not you, you love them or hate them, like the Red Sox, and that's the New York Jets. Uh, that's the newest book, Collision Low Crossers. I also read uh, as a Jet hater, uh, I thought I was going to despise this book, and it turned out it was fascinating. Uh, and even though this book's not about somebody in the intelligence world like the catcher was a spy, there is much in this book that's relevant to the intelligence world as there is in a book directly about the intelligence world. Just football is such a fascinating sport and how it really encompasses a lot of the same tradecraft and ideas that we do here in the intelligence world. So I'm not going to talk here all day. You're not here to hear me. Uh, so let me introduce to you Nicholas Davidoff, uh, who will speak to us today about writing Catcher with a Spy and his new book and about how these two worlds coincide. Um, and then we'll have a chance to ask him questions after the fact. So without further ado, Nick. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and, um, and for having me here at this august and wonderful institution. There isn't another one like it in this country, and um, how wonderful to be here. Uh, I always bring along my spontaneous remarks, even when I'm told to give a casual talk, so here they are. <laughs> uh, so in 1941, uh, Edward Weeks, who was the esteemed editor of the Atlantic Monthly magazine, which is, the Atlantic Monthly, of course, remains a, a, a wonderful publication, and in that time, in the, it was more, a great era of publications, this was um, perhaps even more wonderful publication, got in touch with someone who, who he referred to as one of the most versatile men I have ever known, and that man was Mo Berg. He was getting in touch with him because he wanted him to write an essay for the Atlantic Monthly. Mo Berg was then a coach for the Boston Red Sox, and there weren't too many coaches who were publishing essays and articles in the Atlantic Monthly, but 
Um, maybe you will agree with me when I read you the first sentence of that article that this was a pretty unusual member of a Major League Baseball coaching staff. Baseball men agree with the philosopher that perfection, which means a pennant to them, is attainable only through a proper combination of opposites. The last sentence, by the way, is the game's the thing, and really good writers know that you, are, you want to inflect your writing with both long sentences and short sentences to achieve rhythm. Moberg was a really good writer. He was also a really, really interesting person, and this is a really, really interesting essay. It included references to Ben Franklin, to Michel Montaigne. There were passages in Latin, passages in Greek. There was a section on yarn-winding technology. Uh, there's a sentence that reads, the catcher is the cerebus of baseball. And um, I was fascinated. At the time, I was a young writer at Sports Illustrated, and this was all I knew of Moberg. I'd encountered this essay in an anthology of great baseball writing, and I'm pretty sure that, 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 that it remains the greatest thing ever written about the sort of theory, if you will, of baseball by a baseball player. And uh, so I'd encountered it in this wonderful baseball anthology edited by a guy named John Thorne. And I just, it said in the little introduction that not only was Moberg a baseball player, it said that he spoke a dozen languages and that he'd been a spy. And this was really interesting to me, but you know, lots of things are interesting in the world, and I was going along. I was a young writer at Sports Illustrated, and then one of the editors asked me if I would write something about Mo Berg. I was sort of the logical person there, I guess, to do this, just because I was only, I was sort of on the periphery of sports at America's great sports magazine, right? I was, I, I was the person who was writing about Costa Rican rainforests. I wrote about a zoo in Belize. I wrote, um, I'm trying to think. I, I wrote about a biologist who was interested in the athletic capacities of lizards who staged the Lizard Olympics. I mean, you know, I was, one might say, marginally a sports guy at this sports institution. And so, anyway, this editor asked me to write about Mo Berg. And, um, you know, I, I, I began to write about Mo Berg. While I did, I got a call from a book editor in New York who I'd been talking to occasionally. And I, one of my problems at Sports Illustrated is I always wanted to write longer about the things that I was interested in that there was room for. This book editor was encouraging me to, to, to write for him. And he said, what are you up to? And I said that I was writing this piece about Mo Berg. And he said, well, you know, that sounds like a wonderful book to me. And I said, you know, I, I'm not sure that, I mean, I love sports, but I'm not sure that I really want to write a sports book. Plus, this guy, you know, he, he was a major league baseball player, but really he's much more interesting as a character. I think I'd want to write a character study. He said, that's exactly what I want you to do. And so it began. It was easy to assemble a basic sketch of Moberg's life. Moberg's family came from the Ukraine to Newark, New Jersey, where his father owned a drugstore. Moberg did occasional work in the drugstore. He, they, were, they were Jewish. Moberg, um, in the 1920s, became a student at Princeton University. That's a very unusual pedigree for Princeton at that time. He was a great student of languages and linguistics. He um, studied Spanish, he studied Sanskrit, he studied French, Latin, other languages as well. And he probably remains the greatest baseball player in Princeton history. Upon graduation, he wanted to go to the Sorbonne. And to pay for it, he joined the Brooklyn Dodgers as uh, a shortstop. He later converted to catcher. Uh, and this sort of straddling went on for quite a while. He would spend time at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia and at Columbia Law School, missing spring training every year to complete his classes and exams, which always put him a little bit behind. So nobody ever really knew how good he was. But in fact, by the late, I think, 1920s, he was considered an ascending catcher, a, a player of great promise. And then he hurt his knee. Um, after that, he became a Major League Baseball player on the margins of the sport. He was an intelligent handler of pitchers, so to speak. He knew a great deal about how to catch, how to think about the game, but he couldn't run very well, and he couldn't hit as well as he used to. And so he, the, the line about Berg always then was that he could speak a dozen languages and he couldn't hit in any of them. Um, he had some great adventures as a sort of celebrated Major League Baseball player. He was celebrated because sports writers were really interested in him. Sports writers at that time had to, well now we live in the time of the web, but at that time sports writers had to compile a vast number of articles um, you know, to satisfy their, their, their editors and they were willing to write about anything and Moberg was a great fount of copy for them. And uh, so they were always sitting down and writing these hilarious pieces about him in which he would opine about the events of the day and he was very funny and he was, 
um, he was very charismatic with writers, and so there's a vast library of pieces written about Mo Berg in daily newspapers over those years. Uh, and, and he did lots of interesting, other interesting things as well. He went on a trip with people like Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth to Japan, where uh, he played Japanese exhibitions. And he was the lone player on that trip who actually took an interest in the Japanese language. And he became subsequently a fairly beloved American figure in Japan because baseball, as you probably know, is the great Japanese sport as well as the great American sport. And Moberg was, in his own way, partly responsible for the ascent of baseball in Japan. The great quiz show of that time was Information, Please. Moberg was an absolute star on Information, Please. And this increased his reputation as someone who was really two things, this sort of dual personality. Somebody who was in Major League Baseball, but was known throughout baseball as, so to speak, an intellectual. Um, he, the, he, of course, knew many, many baseball players, and he also liked the baseball player's life. You know, but ball players, for the most part, were spending five days at the stadium. They traveled in first-class trains, and they, traveled, they lived in businessmen's hotels. And Berg loved the idea of moving from prominent American city to prominent American city, spending a few hours at the ballpark, and then disappearing into his day. He'd, he might have been here one day had it existed. He was at museums. He was at galleries. He was running around talking to interesting people. He was a figure on the move. And um, he just he just seemed to he, he just seemed to people to the to the journalists who knew him and to people who played with him a mysterious compelling person uh, how did i write a piece and then a book about a mysterious compelling person well, well, the first thing that I did was, well, the baseball record is easy when you're writing about someone like that. You find the old newspapers. You, there's, there was a substantial record, as I just told you, of his conversation with journalists. But also, you can find you know, a statistical record of every, every game that he ever played. And I did that going to places like Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, to Reading, Pennsylvania, and to all the other you know, little towns and big towns in which he played. And you could find a record of that. And um, then I did what everyone who is in this sort of position does, which is um, who wants to do it right, which is that I called everyone who ever knew Mo Berg. And I talked to an incredible range of people, and I learned things that were far more interesting to me than the fact that within the realm of, you know, unstudied realm of Major League Baseball, that Mo Berg was the great intellectual. I learned that he was a really eccentric person, that he had all sorts of personal fetishes. For example, he went from wearing a, Mo, a baseball uniform to a Mo Berg personal uniform uniform, which was a gray suit, a black tie, and a white shirt every day. One day, one of his roommates opened the closet. You never wanted to sort of intrude on Berg's life, but the roommate opened the closet, and there was an ident 10 identical sets of Moberg clothes. Um, this was unusual. He also loved newspapers, but he was a bit particular about his newspapers. He carried eight or maybe eight or ten of them a day, and if anybody wanted to read one of the ones that he wasn't reading, he would become very agitated and he'd yell, it's alive, it's alive! And if somebody touched, say, his Washington Post that he hadn't yet read, he wouldn't read it. And, pardon? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, it's just unusual. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I thought that he was unusual um, in, in, that, in, in so many ways. Um, but I also knew from the article and from people that I'd begun to talk to that there was this whole life that Moberg lived after baseball as a spy. And I really had no idea. How do you find out about a spy? The first thing that I did was I went to the OSS archives, which is a vast, just an amazing trove of paper only I would say marginally organized here in Washington at the National Archives. And I went there and I basically installed myself and I read through anything I could find that had anything to do with Mo Berg. And whether it had to do with Mo Berg was itself a bit of a task because everything's encrypted, everything's in code, and you know, I knew his code name, which was Remus, and gradually I figured things out and I came to know a little bit better who were some of the people he was associated with. And it was kind of amazing. Over time, you could put together the moment-to-moment -moment existence from dispatches sent back from all the places where Mo Berg was of the things that he was doing as a member of the OSS. He was a mem the OSS, as you probably know, um, is a forerunner of the CIA, is the forerunner of the um, CIA, and it was something that was created in kind of an ad hoc way. 
um, many of the people who joined, I remember that I talked to one OSS veteran, and I was asking about just the character of the organization. He said, oh yeah, we were just basically all sorts of egomaniacs and crazies. And Moberg fit right in. And it was a lots and lots of just really, really interesting people from unusual parts of life. There were bartenders, there were men who uh, hung out at clubs, there were members of Murder Incorporated, there were artists, Julia Child was a member of the OSS and she told me all about eating and cook, <laughs> cooking water buffalo as a member of the OSS. Um, there was, there was a vast range. Henry Ringling North, the circus king, was a member of the OSS. Um, all kinds of people were members of the OSS, and Moberg fit right in just because he was such an unusual person. Um, he, I should, of course, tell you what he was doing. You all know about Los Alamos. You know about the Manhattan Project. And Moberg was one of the rare Americans, it turns out, who knew about it as well. He was charged with anybody who knew about the Manhattan Project, which you know, was the most classified project that you could imagine at that time, had a great worry. And the great worry, the great anxiety was is that there was an analogous project that was being created by the great German scientists of the time, most namely Werner Heisenberg, but Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker and all, lots of other scientists too, that Germany was building an atomic bomb and maybe they were building it faster. And America and American intelligence, and particularly people like General Leslie Groves, who's in charge of the Manhattan Project, needed to know, and they needed somebody who could help them to find out. I mean, how do you find out about this? And Moberg was one of the very few people who was charged with finding out about this. And he was, you know, he had sort of a freelancing personality, the same sort of personality that I tried to describe just for a little for you um, while he was in baseball, applied in the OSS. He would go off and he would just show up in various places and show up at the OSS office and then he would leave and nobody really knew where he was, but these dispatches would come in. This was, of course, irritating to more organized and polished and bureaucratic and professional intelligence operators like Alan Dulles, who happened to be one of his bosses. And I remember the great joy in the National Archives one day when I found a reproachful missive sent to Washington by Dulles that said something like, confidential, Berg is probably pretty good at what he does, but he's about as easy to handle as an opera singer and I can't stand working with him and what, you know, there were things like that. And that's, that's, that sort of gave me, I think, a flavor for the life that I was dealing with. What makes a good spy? Well, you can probably imagine that people were interested in Moberg as a spy because he was someone with great facility with foreign languages. Maybe not as great as was implied by that, that the famous one-liner, but pretty good too. He picked up languages very quickly. He, he's obviously an extremely intelligent man. He was also really charming. He was charming in the way that sometimes you might think that a photographer is challenging. Photographers, in order to get their picture, have to have a fair, have to have a combination of a certain kind of seduction they have to bring people close to them, and yet they also have to retain a distance because once that picture is taken, they have to move on. Moberg was really, really good at sort of achieving a level of real personal warmth, which would just then melt away. He was here and then he was gone. That was sort of the pattern all his life. Um, and he also just had a great interest in secrecy and a facility for tradecraft. And I think that people within, within the OSS thought he was really good at what he did. But one of the things that interested me about him is, is that I came to slowly start to know people who had supposedly known him. Over and over they'd say, I didn't really know him. So the way in effect that I wrote the book, and certainly that part of the book is, I would say each of those people who didn't really knew, know him knew one thing about him. And I created this vast pile of index cards, which were the one fact that somebody knew about Moberg. And then I organized them in, te in, in, in terms of theme, and usually personal theme, although of course sometimes in terms of whatever event was going on in his life. And in the end, I created what I, I remember it sitting there next to my keyboard was this really tall pile. And I wrote all the way down the pile so that it got lower and lower, and then there were two towers, and then at the end there was this other tower and there was one last thing. And that's really how I organized the book. I mean, when I talk to writing students about these things like that, I always, I always say that I, it was like my railroad train, and that first, before making the tower, it went from being a railroad train to a tower, which is to say, you, you, there were so many disparate pieces of the life and you know a spy and a baseball player it was such a choppy existence since this guy was always on the move that you had to lay all those index cards. I eventually laid them all out on the living room floor and I started moving them around until finally I had this vast train track and then I picked up the train track and made those towers. Anyway, that's pretty technical, but that's how I did it. <laughs> um, um, and then I started, and, you know, you heard from the most unusual people. It turned out that all sorts of people who knew Moberg would write me letters like this. Moberg used to hide in 
in a room in the attic of our house, a secret room built by my father. Um, my father may know much, but he is tight-lipped. And so I received this, and I thought, this is interesting. And I turned it over for the return address. There was no return address. It was signed only with a woman's first name. I got things like that all the time. It was, it was a really strange experience writing about someone because all these, but many of the people who were, it was, a, it was an unusual combination of people being very interested in your subject and yet knowing, not knowing a lot about him. And that, I think you will agree, feels a little bit like what we're talking about, which is espionage. I think you'll also agree that this is something that maybe isn't perhaps necessarily the best tactic when you're a spy, which is to say that your spies are generally people who you don't notice. And this sort of overt secretive behavior was actually very noticeable. And um, so while in someone like me and some of the people who knew him, he's attracting curiosity, you could perhaps begin to see why for someone like Alan Dulles, this is a more complicated proposition. Here is a man who is professionally secretive, but secretive in such an overt way that he's compelling attention to himself. And that was troubling to people like Dulles. So then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going very quickly through this life, and if you, you know, if, if you have further questions about it, you can certainly ask. But um, I want to say that Mo what Mo Burke really learned was of exceptional importance. What he learned was that there, if there was any kind of German atomic bomb program, it was inchoate at best, certainly not incipient, and that um, people didn't need to worry. Of course people would worry. The mere possibility of this, you wouldn't want it on your conscience that even though all the evidence was telling you that something like this didn't exist, that maybe it did exist. You know, there was always that nagging worry. So he was checking through the war. But his intelligence was true, and it was honorable, and it was good. There was no, you, there was no promising German atomic bomb program. You become famous as a spy for discovering things that exist. He discovered, he proved a negative, so to speak. That's a more difficult way to make your, make, make your name in, in tradecraft. Um, so then after, you know, I'd also been told that after the OSS, Berg came back, and like many people who were in the OSS wanted to join the CIA. And um, he gave very much the impression, as, as, I've made, as I've just suggested, that he was involved in the secret world. And um, how did I find out about that? I mean, I, um, I, didn't really know. I didn't really know how to find out about someone who worked for the CIA. I mean, the whole point of the, uh, the, point of the endeavor is to keep things secret. Why were they going to tell me what someone did? And I had the great good fortune to meet a man named Thomas Powers. Thomas Powers was, is the author of a wonderful book, which I commend to all of you, called Heisenberg's War. He'd also written a book about Richard Helms and the CIA, which is many people consider one of the finest books ever written about American intelligence. And he invited me up to see him, and he became, he became in a funny way, my intelligence mentor. He, told, he put me in touch with Richard Helms, and Richard Helms agreed to see me here at the CIA. And I went to see him, and he said, you know, I can assure you that Moberg had no real role with us. And I said, well, you know, I, I appreciate you telling me this, but if he did have a role, why would you tell me? And he said, I can understand your predicament, but you can just trust me that this isn't true. If he did have a real and significant and in any way operationally ongoing role, I wouldn't be talking to you. And I said, well, this is my subject, and I'm really interested in him, and I know he had some small role. Is there a way to find out about this? CIA operations files and personnel files are kept secret. No one can see them the way I could see the OSS files. And so he said, here's what I'll do. I'll put you in touch with one of our staff psychiatrists who has seen Moberg's files, and you can ask him questions. And so effect, what happened one day at the behest of Richard Helms is that I went to the CIA, and I played Moberg. And I allowed, in effect, a CIA staff psychiatrist to have a session with me where he told me things about myself. And it was one of the stranger, but it was a really, really, <laughs> it was a really, really wonderful and incredibly entertaining, but really interesting and, and, and um, useful, useful moment. And it, 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 it seemed, you know, I talked to William Colby too. I talked to all sorts of people. I talked to people in Rock Creek Park on park benches who had known okay. Berg during the war. I talked to people in apartments on Beacon Hill full of Asian antiques. One of the things that really I loved about Mo Berg, both in, in baseball and in espionage, is that the people who 
were in those fields were just as interested in him as I was. There was just something about this particular guy that made people curious. And as you all probably know, there's no greater appetite uh, for reading spy novels than good spy novels than by people who've worked at the CIA. It's the, um, it's the single largest spy novel reading demographic, I'm told. <laughs> um, so, and then what about the rest of his life? If he wasn't working for the CIA, but he was running around, you know, furtively putting his finger to his lips at all times, what was he doing? Moberg was a person, I, don't, I, I would recommend to you a wonderful book called Footsteps, which is by the great um, British biographer Richard Holmes, and this is one of his first books. And he's gone on to write prize-winning biographies of people like Coleridge, and he's written great accounts of different scientific movements in the 19th century. But his first, th this early book that he wrote called Footsteps is a, called The Adventures of a Romantic Biographer. And it tells of how, when he was a young man, he went on a series of walks and expeditions to find out about people, writers, who had been meaningful to him. And one of the things, one of the writers who was meaningful to him was Robert Louis Stevenson. And he, he writes a great deal in relation to these writers that Holmes does, uh, in relation to these writers who interest him, about movement and about travel. And I remember coming across this line about Stevenson, I travel not to go anywhere, but to go. And I thought, that's Mo Berg. He's not going anywhere per se, he's just a guy who has to keep moving. He always has to be on the go, he never knows where he's gonna be tomorrow. He's just a person who needs, in the way of baseball and in the way of being an OSS intelligence agent, he just needs to keep moving, he can't stand still. He can't stand still conversationally, he can't stand still physically, and um, this for me anyway was a great insight. Uh, and I came to see that over the last 30 years of his life, he moved rapidly from place to place. He knew a lot of really interesting people. He spent six weeks with Joe DiMaggio. He knew, um, he knew Einstein. He knew Jimmy Breslin. He knew um, many, many attractive women. He knew many unattractive sports writers. He, <laughs> who, who, who um, allowed him to, when they were on the road with a baseball team, would allow him, they'd get a, a double, they'd get two, two beds in their room, and they'd, they'd always know that Mo would be there, and they'd come back from the ball game, they'd open up the door, and he'd be in the bathtub. He took like an unbelievable number of baths every day. He traveled light. He carried only a, with him a toothbrush, a razor, a couple of books, and newspapers which were coming out of his pockets like weeds. And um, he, deep in the night, went, he didn't want people to know anything about him, so he washed his, these wash and wear gray suits. He washed them deep in the night, and so if you brushed against him the next morning, you'd, you'd feel the dampness of his sleeve. He was just moving, 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 moving. He was telling stories about himself, but they were st stories that were meant to entertain and to meant to um, enliven your curiosity. They weren't really gonna tell you that much about him. And after a while, I began to be dissatisfied with him as his biographer. I began to think, this guy's a charlatan, this guy's a fraud. You know, he's letting the world know that he's this significant CIA person when really all he's doing is running around pretending to be a spy. And, um, and so I felt sort of frustrated. But then I thought more about it, and I thought, you know, on one level, certainly this is, the, he, he's putting something on, but on another level, to pretend to be a spy and really carry it off, to live your life as a faux spy or a spy manqué, that's a really, really original thing to do. I can't think of anybody who ever did that and pulled it off and survived. Um, I also noticed that Berg kept a, a vast amount of objects and mementos and souvenirs from his life. People who are trying to be secretive, who don't want other people to know about him, them, don't behave that way. And that made me think that Mo Berg was However uncomfortable he was in the world and uncomfortable he was with himself, he was someone who lived to be written about. And um, that he didn't, that he wasn't comfortable himself, with himself, that he wasn't the person who maybe he wanted people to think he was, for a while distracted me, but eventually I saw that I had come across in a completely original person who found a very original, very human, and very, I thought, humane way to go through life. It was a somewhat troubling story, but to me, it was a beautiful story. And for me, you know, on one hand, he's part James Bond, part Babe Ruth. I mean, he was in the major leagues in two of the great sort of professions that are part of the American masculine daydream, right? But to me, what was most original and most, and what, uh, for my book, what for me meant the most was to see this person who traveled nowhere but to, who didn't travel anywhere except to go, who lived a life without calendar, who had to make up his life every day, and who also made up his personality. 
you don't run across too many people who have the ingenuity to do something like that. And for me, this was terribly impressive. Moberg um, was challenging to write about because of this particularly um, obscured personality, but that's not generally true of Major League Baseball. M of, all the, of all the great sports, baseball has easily been the sport which has been the great writer sport. Um, and there are a few reasons why so many people from you know, Ring Lardner and from and Thurber all the way to the great, and, and, st and still great Roger Angel and Roger Kahn and all sorts of wonderful people, American writers wrote well about baseball. And um, I'll just tell you very quickly m my thinking about why this might be. Part of it's that everybody has played baseball, so it appeals to the imagination. Also, the pace of the game is deliberate and it, it, it is punctuated by many, many pauses, which allows time for reflection, but also feels a little bit literary in its way. A game that moves slowly with time for thought and time for analysis and time for reflection, that's like writing, isn't it, a little bit? Um, it's also transparent. You can see the players' faces. People who are writing about baseball go and talk for hours before and after the game with the players. We all know the rules, and what happens is ha takes place on a very visible, very visible, public arena. You can see everything that's going on. Um, also, the players are of typical human proportion, so it's very easy to imagine yourself, if you're a writer or a reader, into that role, so to speak. Uh, the rules are, are clear. And also, the nature of the sport is that it individuates. The ball moves from place to place. And as Mo Berg began to talk about in that essay that I read you a little bit of, the, ga the, the game's the thing. You can see the game right. It's a very visible game. Baseball isn't the sport of spies. For me, the sport of spies really is football. Football is the single most popular activity in America today. And one of the things that fascinated me from the beginning, I was not a, really particularly a football person, but one of the things that fascinated me for years is that people would watch football games, more people than watching anything else in American life, and they don't know what's going on. <laughs> the game is controlled by coaches who stand there, you've seen them, with those, with, those, with those large headphones on, and they're holding what looks like a diner menu or a bistro menu, and they're holding it like this in front of their faces to you know, preclude opposition lip reading. And on that, on that is what's called a game plan, on that diner menu. And the game menu is made up entirely of encryption. It's, it's a series of instructions, it's a series of options, it's a series of plays that are gonna determine what happens at this vastly public spectacle where it's a real feat. Nobody knows what's going on. The game is planned beforehand. You have no idea about the plan. You watch the game, you have no idea still about the plan or whether it worked or whether it didn't. And then the game is over and you'll still never know what that plan is. And I was interested in game plans. I just like this juxtaposition of something that was so public and so secret. Football, however, I knew, has been a very, very difficult subject. It's quite the opposite of baseball for writers. It's difficult for a number of reasons. The players themselves are obscured. They wear masks, right, and they also wear body armor, so, they're, so what they look like is they, you know, they sort of blend into one. The ball itself is hard to see. There's this big scrum, and there are these very large men and moving very quickly, and there's this tiny ball, so it's like a pea in a bowl of pears or something like that. It, was, you know, it peeks out from time to time, but it's hard to follow, even now with all the advances in television. As opposed to baseball, football has a more texting pace. Something happens very quickly, and then there's a stop, and then it happens quickly again, and it's really, really hard to follow. Football, as I said, has its own language. The language is unknown to most people. I later discovered that the language differs from team to team, and um, when I myself tried to learn the language, I was a dismal failure at it. Uh, it also, the rules for football change all the time, and, and the rules, even when they exist, are pretty abstruse. So I found the game hard to understand. So I thought it was the most, po it was an amazing thing that something could be this popular and concealed in plain sight. Football takes place by and large not in the games that we watch, but it's an all week, seven day, seven day a week affair that takes place at what are called the NFL facilities. These are these vast walled places where the games are planned and practices take place and there are all these studying rooms and things. And um, you know, I really wanted to visit a facility and I really wanted to know how it worked. My own books I've written, this is, I'm now working on my sixth book. My own books I've written about in Mo Berg, I've written about an economist, I wrote about country music, I wrote about um, a, a, a memoir of my childhood growing up in New Haven, Connecticut. They're a very varied amount of books and what they really have in common for me is that they're, each one of them deals with a certain kind of theme that I've always wanted to write about. And for the football book, 
one of the things I aspired to do was to slow it down so that I could see it the way I could see a baseball game. And I thought, how can I possibly slow it down? And then when I met a football team and I got to know some of the coaches who were planning games, I began to see that planning a football game, the group of seven coaches who were planning the games and planning the season, they matched up with one of those themes that I wanted to write about, which was the regulars. I'd always wanted to write about you probably are familiar, many of you, with Richard Rhodes's great book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, which is really boils down to a group of incredibly gifted, interesting people who are coming together with a tremendous sense of urgency and a tremendous sense of personal fulfillment to do something that is really important to them and to other people, and that was all the scientists who are coming together to make this bomb. And it didn't matter to me. I thought of them as the regulars. It didn't matter to me whether these regulars were teachers or whether they might be lawyers. And I began to see that the football coaches who are building a football game in a football season could be my regulars. And that's where the game really started. And um, so I thought I might just close before, if you want to ask some questions, you're more than welcome to. I thought I might close by just reading you a little section from the football book just because it's fun after somebody's been talking and talking about books to actually hear a little bit about them. So I'm just going to read you. You may know that football game, the football season is, is there are a number of games that are played before the 16-game regular season. And those games are called exhibition games. And there's no exhibition game that's less important than the fourth game of the exhibition season. The people who play in the fourth game are only people who are on the bubble, who may or who are fighting for one of the last roster spots on team. None of the stars play. Uh, I've been, the, the team that allowed me to come and spend better part of two years with them to write this book was the New York Jets. It could have been any team. It could have been the Redskins. I was writing about football. I wasn't particularly writing about any one team. I've now been with the Jets for seven months out of a season. This is the last preseason game. It's of no consequence except to those few players. Some of you may be familiar with The Wire, the great television show, and one of the things that The Wire does so well is it introduces a blizzard of characters, and you can keep them all straight because they're introduced so beautifully. I, I can't do that here. I can't tell you that you're going to hear a series of names because football teams are full of names. Baseball play teams have just a few characters. Football teams, upwards of 100 people you'll come through during the course of a season. But a couple of the piece of people that you will want to remember here are Mike Pettin, who was the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets. He's now the head coach of the Cleveland Browns. There, a guy named Jim O'Neill, who is the safeties coach of the Jets. He's now the defensive coordinator of the Browns. And um, so I'm just going to read you a little bit about this last preseason game against the Philadelphia Eagles in which the Jets are playing. The last preseason game mattered so little that Mike Pettin intended to give the other defensive coaches on the Jets the experience of calling a play series under live conditions. The day before the game, each of them received a call sheet. Nicky Pettin told me, study up. He handed me a color-coded, glossy piece of paper with calls from the playbook listed under the various personnel groups and then invited further by the down and distance situation. Be ready, he said. You'll be in control of a multi-million dollar machine. Immediately, there was a sense of panic. From the installs, I had a vague understanding of some of the plays. I had no confidence I'd remember them under pressure, much less know how to select them in relation to the strengths and weaknesses of young Philadelphia Eagles players I'd never heard of. Still, who could resist? I began to work up mnemonics to memorize calls like Odd Wolf Fire Zone, 3-2 Crown 1, Nickel Dog 1, and Dime Spike 1 Vegas, calls that were, of course, mnemonics already. Invariably interesting was the etymology of the call names. Zip Double Field was for Jason Taylor, the former Jets pass rusher who'd played his college ball at the University of Akron, whose team name wa nickname was the Nip Zips. Squirrel dated back to the Baltimore Ravens and referred to the Ravens linebacker Jarrett Johnson, whose rural small town southern childhood was said to involve squirrel hunting and maybe also squirrel eating. The players thrived on these little recognitions. With the calls, the point, of course, was to create names the players could easily remember. As for Dime Spike 1 Vegas, it had its origins in a pass coverage drop Jets head coach Rex Ryan had created when he was in Baltimore for a big defensive lineman named Keith Washington, who'd played his college football at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. <laughs> 
In the locker room at the stadium for the Eagles game, we all put on khaki pants and matching green and white Jets polo shirts and caps. I slipped my folded call sheet into my pocket, then I removed and unfolded it several times to make notes, reminding myself of things. Golf carts drove us through the stadium tunnels to the elevator, which then delivered us to the coaching box at press level. There weren't enough chairs in the box, so I stood behind the Jets coaches as I'd done each week. In that little glassed-in room, even though there were spectators right there in adjoining boxes or in seats below, you felt removed moved from the enormous crowd around you, felt you were sealed off in a capsule that was its own little mind space. Up in the booth, coach after coach had his turn calling defensive plays, passing them down to Coach Thurman, who sent them out to the middle linebacker. At the very end of the third quarter, with the Jets losing a listless game 21-7, to Mike Patton lo looked at me, my heart shifted. Nikki, you ready, he said in that even voice of his. Safety's coach Jim O'Neill was going to call the first and second down plays of the drive. The third downs were mine. O'Neill, excited, said something about, let's do this, buddy. <laughs> I took the seat beside O'Neill and retrieved my call sheet, covered now with so many notations that some calls were illegible. I put on the headphones, thick and warm as earmuffs. On the open defensive channel, I could hear Rex Ryan and Coach Thurman talking down on the sideline. Special teams coach Ben Kotwika, who'd flown night missions in Apache helicopters before coming to the NFL, had told me what to expect from the headphones. Nick, we've got six people on five radios, and it's just like Baghdad. That headset, that headset chirps as much as any radio frequency I was ever on when I was flying. Rex talks to Pet. DT tries to call in the defense. Sut doesn't usually say shit. O'Neill a little bit, but mostly Rex, Pet, and DT. Kotwika believed that if you package it right, Nick, it's the number one show on television. It's comedy. Should we challenge a call or not? Trying to get 11 guys out onto the field on one place, that fog of battle. Everybody's got a game plan, but things happen, and the enemy's got to vote. Petten showed me which button to push to speak. Behind me, Scott Cohen was calling out the personnel groupings for the Eagles players. What looked orderly and matter of fact when Petten did it now felt as though it were happening very, very fast. I looked at my sheet trying to follow as O'Neill made his calls, doing a nice job of backing up the Eagles to third down and 14. All yours, Nick, he said, his voice thrilling with accomplishment. I had no idea what to call. <laughs> I blurted, nickel dog, a five-man pressure. I liked dogs. Then I watched my nice nickel dog leave me, trot smoothly through the wires, stop to get a pat and a command from DT, and then dash out onto the field where the Eagles second-year quarterback Mike Kafka showed my nickel dog a trick, completing a 20-yard throw for a first down. My face was scarlet. How can I explain? There was the feeling that Petten had loaned me something rightfully his, something valuable, something I had no business touching. It was a borrowed sports car I'd wanted to return without scratches, and already it had a big dent. The Eagles' drive continued. Again, O'Neill got to third down, third and two. Again, he said, all yours, Nick. His voice a bit less enthusiastic this time. I'd always liked the sound of dime spike one Vegas. The call meant that the dime or sixth defensive back should blitz. Meanwhile, another one of the defensive linemen, in this case Marcus Dixon, would bluff a rush and then make a Vegas drop into short area pass coverage. Quarterbacks didn't expect a lineman to be prowling around back there. And if the call worked, they wouldn't see Dixon. Dixon was a large figure, nearly 300 pounds. But quarterbacks were like most people, under pressure. They surmised, noticing only what they had seen before. Petten was right. All the sounds around me fell away, and it was intoxicating to be in control of these fast, powerful men to make what was about to happen on a field far below take place. I felt a little like a puppet master. I spoke. They moved. I called for the blitz, garnishing it with the Vegas drop, and then something amazing happened. Kafka, under pressure, threw over the middle, right to where Marcus Dixon's long left arm could reach. Dixon tipped the ball, enabling the defensive back Ellis Langster to intercept the pass and return it 67 yards for a touchdown. In the box, as Langster zoomed towards the end zone, everyone was yelling except me. I was incredulous and now felt like a drug kingpin who'd been sampling some of his own product. In the aftermath, I was struck by how purely happy the coaches were. The play had worked to perfection, just as its designers had imagined it. Dime Spike won Vegas with such a beautifully conceived football idea that rookies and free agents could succeed with it, I could succeed with it. I thought that even as I was completely dumbfounded by the utter luck of it all. And I should tell you that then Patton looked at me and he said, hey, you know, you call a touchdown, you keep going. And so the next set of downs, I led the Eagles straight down the field for a game ceiling Philadelphia Eagles field goal. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to open this up for questions, questions obviously about either Mo Berg, about the new book. Um, and I, OK, I, I sometimes start off the first one, but we, had a, we have a question, several of them already. So we'll, we'll let you get started. Uh, I will butt in eventually with my own questions, but we'll go from here. 
how could uh, Helms dismiss Mo as not being important when didn't he have the job of going to Heisenberg's um, speech in Switzerland and his job was to kill him if he didn't know, if he knew too much regarding the atomic bomb? You're referring to an, uh, one of the stranger episodes in the history of the Second World War intelligence when Berg shows up in Zurich at a gathering, a seminar room gathering of important physicists. It's very rare that German physicists would come out of Germany, but Switzerland's a neutral country, so they go there and meet with Western physicists. And they had a conversation about some per particularly abstruse idea in physics. And Mo Berg was sent to be in this room and was charged with, if he thought that Heisenberg gave away the fact that the Germans were progressing with their bomb program, he was to take the gun out of his pocket and assassinate him. It's a true story. It really happened. But it's also um, a story that you know, makes a lot of people who know that story somewhat incredulous. Berg's German was OK. It was all right. But it was, certainly wasn't fluent. And he certainly wasn't good enough at physics to understand whatever was being talked about up there, which is, you know, per, you know this is cutting edge physics being talked about by the great practitioners of the field. And so if you look at his notes from, from the meeting, what he's doing is he's making sketches of what people look like, whether or not they seem you know, like intimidating people, whether they seem like, you know, he looked back at Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker and he was trying to decide how menacing he seemed. I mean, he was making little character portraits and it's, I mean, to me it's fascinating and it was, a, it's, as you're right to say, a really striking and important moment. But the idea that, you know, a German, a German scientist is going to say, yes, well, you know, actually this, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm really progressing, you'd have to be a little bit skeptical about that. That said, though, this, this really did happen, and it is an interesting episode, and you have to, so, so to speak, since given the subject, cover all the bases. So this really happened. And I think most people really felt that, you know, Moberg did an extremely good job as an OSS operative during the war. Helms wasn't denigrating the work that he did as an OSS operative. He was saying that he was just, he had nothing to do with Moberg. He didn't know him. He was just saying that Moberg had no real role with the CIA, which was also true. The reason that Moberg had no real role with the CIA is because Moberg operated really well in this sort of freelancing atmosphere of the OSS. But the, 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 the CIA was reconstructed as a very, very serious, very organized, very formally created intelligence endeavor. And Mo Berg, like many, many other people, just wasn't a particularly suitable for that kind of organization. He was personally, one might say, he was personally not quite qualified to be a CIA operative in the same way that he'd been a very good OSS operative. Okay. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Sure. That the reason he and Dulles didn't get along was Dulles was anti-Semitic and Mo was Jewish. You know, Nobody ever said anything like that to me. Uh, the people that I knew who were you know, in the business who knew both men, I think that I can only go with a paper trail in what I was told, and that was that Dulles was in charge of many, many things in Bern at the time, uh, in Bern, Switzerland, and Berg would arrive in the office without telling him what he was doing, and he would stir up the whole office with all sorts of things that were going on, to ask people to do all sorts of things for which he couldn't tell him why he was asking to do them. He was, to Dulles, just someone who kept showing up and was a disturbance. As to what I, you know, as to what this all had to do with their personal backgrounds and views of the world, I couldn't say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I made a film on Hank Greenberg, and I can't tell you how many hundreds of people have said to me, "Oh, you're making the film about the player that was a spy." So I've lived with <laughs> Moberg for many years. What's interesting to me is two things. One is. I think it was more dangerous for him because he was Jewish doing all this spy stuff. And I'm sort of curious why you didn't even mention that in passing. T to me, that's really important. I mean, especially if he got caught and they could see he was circumcised. And the second thing is I'd like to know what you know about his family life. I mean, I, I read the book a long time ago, but I think there was a very curious thing with his siblings and the fact that he never married, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly it would have been dangerous for Moberg as a Jewish man traveling around Europe uh, if he'd been traveling in Nazi-occupied terrain. But the secrets that Moberg was carrying were 
too significant, I mean, that he knew about the Manhattan Project and what he was trying to learn about the German atomic bomb program were too important for him to go to such places. So there are untold number of myths about the things that Moeber did and didn't do. And one thing he certainly didn't do was he never went to a place that hadn't already been liberated by the Allies. So that's not to say that it might not have been dangerous for him to be a Jewish man in those places, but he wasn't going, he was going only to liberated terrain. As for his family life, Moberg's family life is a somewhat sad, complicated story. Um, I, would, I would say, I, I, I mean, it's so, there's so much of, about this in the book, I would simply say that you know he grew. He felt that he was a great disappointment to his father, who wanted him to be a professional. He didn't want to be a professional. He lived. He wanted to live a more maybe creative, sort of intuitive life, which he did. But he was well aware that this was a disappointment, and this created. Um, I, it just created. I mean, many many people have complication about families, and Moberg was one of them, as he. Um, you know, made his way through the world. He never owned a house. He had one serious girlfriend when he was young, but it didn't last. He had um, many people who cared about him and were interested in him. I don't know that he ever really had an intimate. If he did, I never found that person. He never owned a house. He lived with his, quite a lot with his brother, who was both envious of him and also loved him. His brother was a doctor in Newark, New Jersey. He lived a very, very unsettled, almost artistic life in certain ways. And um, it wasn't a life for most people, but I found that probably for him, this life in constant motion, this life of, um, this life of being something shining in someone's life and then quickly disappearing before the shine wore off was something that worked for him. Every, many people go through life in many different ways, and um, his was a, certainly a more eccentric and more inventive way. But um, you know, I, as, as I was writing about him, I came to feel a lot of sympathy for him, but also to respect someone who made resourceful and also original decisions about the way he lived his life. One question, <clears throat> says this on, one question, one observation. The question is, um, having read the book many years ago, I can't remember, could you elaborate on how his 1935 films in Japan, uh, in that first post-season tour where he's you know, actually taking out his camera and pho photographing military facilities, how they eventually wound up in the hands of the OSS? And the second uh, to, uh, a observation, which you might want to comment on, you talked about how he lived almost as an overt spy, if you will. Um, that strikes me as an excellent cover, <laughs> in so many words. Uh, react. I just meant that I didn't, if you are trying to um, extract people, information from people and you don't want people to think that you're doing it for governmental purposes, probably not best to call attention to yourself, but you know, we can disagree. Uh, um, as for the films that he made in Japan, yeah, he went to Japan. He, he you know, I, this this was published 20 years ago, and I'm you know well onto other projects. So you you forgive me if some of the dates and details are just the tiniest bit fuzzy at this point. But basically, what he did this was a famous story that he went to Japan in, in a company, someone in the United States who owned a company that had a uh, that that made f travel films gave him a movie camera, and he was supposed to make films. And one day, he didn't go to the game. And instead, he went to the highest point in Tokyo. Tokyo was a city then of very, very low buildings. And it was a hospital. And he went to the top of the hospital, and he made films of Tokyo. And the story later became that these films were somehow passed along to American intelligence and became the basis for the Doolittle Raids. And this story was in previous things that were written about Moberg, and it was widely circulated. And so I naturally thought, wow, Moberg planned the Doolittle Raids. This is pretty interesting. It turned out that. Those films had nothing to do with the Doolittle Raids because, in fact, nobody, Moberg eventually staged a screening of those films for people in intelligence, but the screening took place well after the Doolittle Raids had taken place. And this was at his own behest. He insisted that these were of importance and should be seen by other people. I also met the man who planned the Doolittle Raids. And he had never heard of Moberg, and he said, you know, the idea that these were the only films, I mean, we knew everything about Tokyo. I mean, we'd been, you know, we'd, so it was a great story, but it was an apocryphal story. And the films would have been obsolete by 42 anyway. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Where are they now? Moberg's films? I never saw them. I was, you know, someone once who, one of the people who I ran into who, um, who 
told me a lot about Moberg. He was sort of a collector. He said that he had a copy, and he gave me many materials, but he, I, I never saw that, and I think he always said that he couldn't find it. And um, you know, the way it is with history, so many of the, of, of, of the of, uh, documents and archival materials that you want to see, you don't see. So you can't, I mean, the idea that any book about any person, the idea that it might be comprehensive is, of course, you can never be comprehensive, but you get to a point when you're writing a book like this where everybody that you're talking to thematically, it's all consistent, and then you feel like you're coming to a place where you can begin to write about the person. Um, but I, I, I remember the feeling when I was writing about my grandfather, who was a, a great economic historian who never wrote the great book that everybody expected him to write about European economic history. And what some of his colleagues, you know, he was dead by the time I wrote about him, used to say is that, my grandfather was frustrated by how much there was possible to know about everything, and that that thwarted him in his efforts to write because he could never get started because there was always more to learn. I think that the people who know the most really know how little they know. So I'm going to take the last question. Um, you were talking about Dulles and the relationship with Moberg. I, in my research, I ran into another person who worked heavily with Moberg during the Second World War, and we actually had a little conversation about this beforehand. Uh, the head of the U.S. effort to discover what was going on in Nazi Germany was a man named Boris Pasch. He was a colonel commander of what's called Alsace Mission. And his memoir talks about running into Berg on several occasions, but Pasch hated Berg so much he never names him by name in his memoirs. It's always the big captain or the burly captain. And that's the kind of way Berg rubbed off in some ways on people of and, and Pash was like Dulles, very structured, very much the military way, and just this freewheeling captain who met Pash for the first time in a Rome, ha uh, Rome uh, place where you stay when you don't have a room, uh, a ho hotel. I was going to say hospital about ten times, a, a hotel uh, with his feet up on the on the desk and say, "How you doing, <laughs> Colonel?" I was like, "Excuse me, Captain." What? Um, can, you know any of that relationship? Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, I think, I think just more broadly, the relationship, I mean, it, the, I remember as you're speaking, reading pa Pash's book and the way in which, the, the, the incredibly insulting ways that Pash finds to refer to Berg without referring to Berg by name. I mean, it was clear that sort of Berg grounded at him all his life. You know, there are a lot of people who have, a, you know, in a chain of command, people are pretty territorial about whatever their command is, especially in dire operations like this. And Berg was a freelancer who was sort of swimming in and out of people's lives, and he's really annoyed. You could understand from their point of view why this would be annoying, and you could understand from his point of view why he was just doing what he was told to do. So they were really sort of people who are interested in the same form of work who are operating in two different and not terribly agreeably parallel channels. That's really what went on. And Pash was a rough, feisty guy. And when Berg was sort of just lounging there and didn't immediately climb to his feet and salute him, this enraged Pash. And I think, you know, Tom Powers and I used to talk about the way in which Pash stayed enraged with Berg pretty much throughout the rest of his life. And that's why he doesn't fear in the book. But I mean, this, is, this isn't, you know, I, I, I always, you know, I always interpreted this simply as a clash of personalities. And, and we all know that high strung efforts like the kind of work that these people are doing, if you are a high strung or you, if you are a strong personality, it's only going to emphasize those personal characteristics. That's, so that's how I always saw it. I saw it as it was sort of an oil and water situation. Right. Yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Nicholas Davidoff for uh, being here at the National Spy Museum today.